Good morning. Welcome to our Bible class together. Thank you for joining me again here at our virtual class. We are studying 1 Peter chapter 2 today, the first 10 verses. Have you ever built a house? If you haven't, you've missed an experience. When Vicki and I lived on the Gulf Coast, we bought our first home. The, the problem was that we had to, it wasn't yet built. And we saw houses that we really did like, but a particular builder had them for sale and we went to look at one. And he said, well, that's fine, but this one's already spoken for. He said, but if you really want a house, I can build you one on a lot that I own not far from here. So we agreed and the process began. Every morning though, I would get out of bed and I'd ride a bicycle over to the lot and I'd watch the progress. Bulldozers would clear the land and backholds would dig the foundation. Concrete would fill that, that big pit that would make the foundation. And it really didn't look like much then. Concrete with pipes sticking out of it. But then the wall framing started and shape began to emerge. And step by step, the house took place. And the day came in that we moved in. We raised our children in that house and wept when we left. People are not the only builders of houses. God built a house as well. Peter remembered the words of Jesus in response to his confession that, he was the, that Jesus was the Son of God. When Jesus told him, And I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock, this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God was building a church, one that would stand the onslaught and assault thrown against it throughout all time. What would it take to have a house like that? Today, Peter describes it in our lesson. But first, a little bit of background, just so we'll be all caught up. As we make our way through 1 Peter, I think it's vital to remember that Peter had a point that he's trying to drive home. That point that we're all pilgrims in this world, we're strangers in a strange land, and Christians were, in his time, were facing devastating persecution. They lost homes, jobs, and possessions. They faced ridicule and even death itself. They smelled the smoke before they felt the fire. So how do you prepare people for the problems that life will hand them? How do you encourage them in the most discouraging circumstances? And more importantly, what did God put in place to help them and us withstand the coming terror to maintain our faith in a hostile world? First, it begins with preparation. No one builds a house by going to a hardware store, buying some lumber and some nails, and just start swinging a hammer. For a house to last, it takes some preparation. And that's true about the house that God builds. The tragedy of our modern English versions is the way scholars of the past have divided it into chapters and verses. I think it leaves us believing that once you get to the end of a chapter, a whole new thought begins, when really it's the continuation of the previous idea. And I think that is most especially true in this lesson. Because if you take the first three verses of this lesson, they really go with a thought that began in chapter 1 and verse 22. That's where Peter says, Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, we looked at that last week. But I think if you'll look at this, pa this passage, you can find out that it continues in today's lesson. We were purified by our obedience. Now he goes on to say, what else is it going to take to have the kind of pure, sincere love of the brethren? Because what we're going to talk about today is the building of a church. And the building of a church has to do with the people in it. How do we love one another so when the church gets built? First, he says, we must rid ourselves of some behaviors and attitudes. While obedience cleanses us from our sins, there's something else that has to take place. He says, so put away 
all the malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And Peter tells us what has to happen. We have to take off all the dirty clothes of our past and dispose of them. One year, I remember I went to Nicaragua and I found a problem. We had gone to a place where we spent a day in a clinic and it was hot, it was, it was windy, and it was dusty. And so the dust blew terribly. When I got home, I unpacked, and the jeans that I had worn that day had dirt in all the fibers. I washed them, but when I looked at them again, the dirt, no matter what I tried to do, was still embedded in it, and it would not come out. If I really wanted to get rid of the dirt, the only thing I can do is throw away the jeans. And that is what happens to the attitudes of a sinful life. They don't come out with reform. You don't just make them a little bit better. You get rid of them completely. You have to throw the dirty stuff out because there's no way to clean it up. So what's standing in the way of sincere love? Peter says this, first of all, malice. That's a general term for evil in the ancient world, and it encompasses everything that Peter is about to discuss in these three or four next traits. He goes on to talk about hypocrisy, which is hiding behind the mask of goodness without any desire or intention of ever being any better. Hypocrisy is designed to fool others, to take advantage of them. After all, haven't you met salesmen? They really don't care about you, but they act like you're, they're your best friend just to get the sale. That's hypocrisy. It's designed to fool someone, to take advantage of them. Envy as one writer puts it, is the last sin to die. Because it's wanting what someone else has that you cannot have, and if you cannot have it, you want to deprive them as well of having it. Now Peter knew about that quite well because he felt it. He felt it on the road that was being traveled on in Mark chapter 10. James and John had beat their fellow disciples to the punch by asking for the prime positions of the kingdom when it would happen. And the disciples, I think including Peter, because it doesn't exclude him, grumbled because they wanted those prime spots, and if they couldn't have it, they didn't want James and John to have it either. Envy always seeks its own way to the hurt and detriment of others. It's a spiritual python that strangles the soul. Then Peter moves on to slander, which is damaging someone with, with words. It's sinister and it's damning gossip done quietly behind someone's back. It is a silent assassination. If I can malign another, I can step on them at the same time because I can destroy their reputation in advance of destroying the person. These are the daggers that kill Christian love and unity. And they're the opposite of God's love for us. And even though the new birth gives us a fresh start, there are some old ways that Christians need to take out and put in the trash. Because you see, spiritual life abhors a vacuum. You cannot empty something out without filling it with something else that's better. Because if not, as the story of the demons that Jesus told all too, tells us all too well, that when the house is cl swept clean of all the evil and is not replaced by something good, the demons just return, and there's more of them the second time than the first. That is the, the spiritual reality. You get rid of something so you can put something else in it. And Peter says we need to replace that self-desire with another thirst, another appetite. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that you may grow up into salvation. It's easy to look at this passage and think it's a growth chart, that there are some people who are infants and then there are some people who are mature, and that is accurate in terms of its thinking, but not to be applied here. In Hebrews 6, it will draw that contrast here. The contrast is only that we ought to be like a newborn who is so ravenous for something to eat that he wants to have it now. You know, every parent of a newborn baby understands it only too well. 
all the kid wants to do is eat. Eat and sleep. They'll sleep for a while, they'll get up and eat. They're always doing that. Eating constantly. They don't want to wait. Because if you make a child wait, especially at that age, to eat, they will tell you how much they yearn or long for that. Because they're shouting at the top of their lungs, feed me, when they cry. Peter says we need to long for the pure spiritual milk. We need to yearn for it in such a way that is there. If you return to the end of chapter 1, and it's, it's clear that the, what the milk is, it's the Word of God. But Peter says something about those, the, the Word of God. First of all, he says it's pure. When he, wheat reached the harvest, they would gather it on a blanket in the ancient world and go to a high hill and toss it, and they'd let the wind carry away the light chaff. And once all the chaff was out of the wheat, the wheat was pure, free of chaff. Pure means wheat without chaff, and God's Word is nothing, has nothing in it that will sidetrack faith. When you read it, you do not hear muttered static of men, of opinions being expressed. It is not a spiritual Facebook. It is a clear signal of God. Secondly, though, Peter calls it spiritual. Now, we might think we know what that means, but the Greek word that Peter uses is the word from which we get our English word, logic. Now, we think of logic as being very analytical and very straight-laced, and it doesn't seem to apply here if you use the word spiritual. But for the Greeks, it did, because the Greeks believed that this was the divine reason that governs everything. And that's the sense in which Peter uses it. It defines and controls and explains everything. It's the divine reasoning that is there. And if you want to know what the truth of all things, that's what the Word does. But then finally, Peter says we ought to be longing for that. In Psalm 42, verse 1, the Greek version of the Old Testament applies that word to the deer that pants for the water. The word is a thirst which must be satisfied. In one of my churches, we had a boy with a brain tumor, and it caused some very strange behaviors. It created an overwhelming thirst. He'd drink anything. When nothing was suitable was available, he'd go to the refrigerator and he'd drink pure pickle juice. He'd drink all of it. Not that it tasted good, but his brain said, you are thirsty, you've got to get something to drink, and the family finally had to padlock the refrigerator to prevent him from getting to things that might be harmful. That's the same drive, though, we should have. Those whose thirst is slaked only by God's truth, and when that happens, we can love people the way God loves people, because we're absorbing the pure milk, pure spiritual milk of the Word. God gives in, gets into our lives in such a way that we act like Him. So based on this sincere love, God can build a house. And in the remainder of this lesson, Peter describes the house that God constructs. And so we see the building blocks of this house. As you come to Him, he says in verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones, being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The first critical piece is the stone that holds it all together. Every building has something to carry a load. Ancient buildings had a particular stone. It was either a stone that formed the base or the stone that was placed at the top of an arch that would keep the arch from falling. And the references could be to either. But Peter says that this is a living stone. Now today, the temple that Jesus went to in Jerusalem is mainly gone, except for a single wall. But at the base of that wall 
is a massive stone of granite that was moved hundreds of miles. It was so large that it's not going to move for anything. It is what was left after the destructions of armies. But it's just granite. God put something else in place. The psalmist said in, in Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. When he spoke, he originally meant the nation of Israel. That the, saw, the world saw it as a useless, worthless group of people. But God took it and became the cornerstone of his plan. That was an apt description of the Old Testament. When Jesus comes along, he takes that same passage and quotes it, but applies it differently. Have you never read the scriptures, he says? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's, is, it is marvelous in our eyes, isn't it? He's standing in the shadow of the temple, temple building, and Jesus took the words of the psalmist and replaced them and said, the stone upon which God's plan is built is me. He was there, and the people were seeing God's gray and and grand plan coming together in Him. This is a different kind of stone. Because men took a cursory look at Jesus and they judged Him unworthy to be Messiah. The Jews rejected Him early. He doesn't look much like a king riding on a white horse, defeating the Romans. And they rejected Him. But God saw it differently. He had Jesus at the highest value because he says he was chosen. He was the precious stone. Heaven's valuations are always different than man's. And for many, Jesus just stood in the way of their images of power and glory. Peter would go on to say, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense... They stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. He says the Jewish leaders and the Greek philosophers both saw Jesus as a, as a minor character on the world stage to be easily overlooked. But he always stood in their path. They could never get past him. And they caught their high-minded ideas and preconceived notions on the truth that, that Jesus presented. They never could get past the fact that this was the reality of God. Because you see, the world never does think much about Christ. That's why it doesn't think much about us either. He is at best an equal among others for the world. But many, like Thomas Jefferson, thought of him in kind of in a mythic way that as someone who had great teaching but doesn't do miracles, he's not supernatural, he's just a great man. The Jewish leaders tried to crucify him out of existence, and the Romans tried to persecute him out of their way. Yet God took Christ himself and put him at the foundation. He built the church on top of Jesus, the cornerstone. He saw him as valuable when the world sees him as weak and insignificant. Because remember, heaven's valuations are different than man's. And if you took Christ out of the equation, and many people try to, God's people fall apart. It becomes nothing more than a glorified social club that likes to talk about religious ideas. And sadly, many churches have become that. But while God laid a stone for the foundation, He wasn't finished. A foundation does not make a house. He only put the foundation in place. And then on top of that, He built a different kind of building. Peter says, you yourselves, you Christians, yourselves, you people who are kind of minor it seems like, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer 
spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Christians are those other stones. They're the building blocks of the church as much as the cornerstone. They're the living ones. In every part of the empire, massive religious structures stood. Jerusalem had its great temple of Herod the Great. It, it was built on the foundation of Solomon's grand temple. On Mars Hill, the Parthenon stood with its marble stones forming the backdrop for Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 17. In Smyrna, where there was the massive and ornate temple to Zeus. And each was built with stone chosen to provide a place for the deity to receive adoration. They were all hard, dead stones. That's the kind of temples that men build. But Christianity had nothing as feeble as marble. Instead, God chose to use as His building materials flesh and blood, soul and spirit, formed as a living temple, created by God, the God they would serve. And Peter begins to elaborate on the importance of the church through a series of rapid-fire images. A spiritual house was a structure that was worth being the residence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the house of the Spirit. The church is filled with the Spirit's life. It is to be the kind of people that the Spirit comes in and fills, worthy of His presence because of their obedience and love for Christ. They were a holy priesthood. A priesthood was always offering sacrifices. The Jewish priesthood was, uh, was well-oiled. They knew what to give, when to give, how to give it. And it was constantly happening, all the time. But the sacrifices of the Christians, this holy priesthood that God created, had no higher hide nor hair on them. Instead of the praise of the lips and the works of their faith. There's a story that comes out of Greek history that tells us the Spartan king boasting to a visitor about the walls of Sparta. The visitor inspected the, the city, but he saw no walls. And he was confused. Where are the walls that are you, of which you are so proud, he asked. King of Sparta spread his hand over the bodyguards and troops that served him. These are the walls of Sparta, every man a brick. The same could be said of you and I, every man a brick in the kingdom of God. We form the structure of the grand temple that eclipsed even Solomon's. See, Solomon's temple was built by Hiram. But this one? God is the architect and the builder of this temple. And as verse 6 points out, we who believe in Christ have no reason to shrink back because we have a more excellent house resting on a sturdier foundation. And in verse 9, Peter elaborates even further. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. God chose them. God chose us as much as He chose Israel. He selected those who believed and obeyed to be His children. That's God's selection. That's the criteria for being chosen. No longer was it bloodline, but trust in the blood of Christ made a man chosen. We hear the echoes of God's initial covenant spoken to the Israelites in Deuteronomy ch chapter 7 that applies here. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. 
The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the people. But it was because that the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath He swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out of the mighty by, with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the house hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. What makes something valuable is who owns it, who it belongs to. In 2019, the Lincoln Museum and Historical Society in Springfield, Illinois, found itself running short of money. And it seemed like the only way to raise enough funds to preserve the grave of Abraham Lincoln and the memorial that was there was to begin to sell off some things in the museum that had belonged to Abraham Lincoln himself. Among them was, of all things, the stovepipe hat that he allegedly wore to Ford's Theater on the night of his assassination. The asking price for an ordinary beaver hat that almost any man in the 1860s would have owned for a few dollars was going for $6.5 million dollars because it's not just a hat it's the hat owned by Lincoln the same idea is captured in the choosing because God owns this house because God has chosen the bricks that's what makes them more valuable not the people themselves but the people redeemed by God and the final idea is presented in the 10th verse. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter again reaches way back into the Old Testament. The, the passages he remembered hearing as a boy. And this comes out of the first chapter of Hosea. Hosea was a prophet who spoke with many tools. The primary one he spoke with were symbolic names and acts. Things would happen or names would be given and people would see them and hear them and they would get the message just from the names, if you will. God tells him to marry a woman who will sell herself to other men. It will be symbolic because it's going to break his heart. But the people will see this and they'll begin to get the idea this is what God feels about his wife Israel who's forsaking him for others. And out of this marriage comes three children. Their names are not typical even for Jews. They're symbolic names. The three children of Hosea are Jezreel, lo Ruhamah, and lo Ami. You hear this echoed in 1 Peter chapter 1. We are not a people, but now we are God's people. Lo, a me meant not my people. God was telling wayward Israel that they would be cast into captivity and would no longer be God's people. Then Peter says, Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Lo Ruhamah means no mercy, indicating that God would show no mercy to the wicked. Instead, the Christians who were God's people, who had always spent their life being on the outside looking in, they lived in a state without God's mercy before salvation came to them. Then, with their conversion, they found the mercy of God. This is our spiritual heritage. That's our hope. That's our identity. And Peter wants his audience to see their unique position. They are a house built by God on the foundation of God's own Son. Because of God's great act of 
Our love for both God and for each other has to hold us together. But how does it speak to people under pressure? They were facing the worst of persecution, extreme poverty, and even death. How are these words going to bolster their faith, help them through the storm? Now, we don't have that, but we still feel the subtle pressure of secular thought today. Is this a practical passage or theological? I think it's both. We've covered the theology, but I think you need to remember two ideas. Things that are very practical. Things that if you keep them in your mind will keep you safe and keep you on firm footing. Since Christ is the cornerstone, we have stability. No matter who the power is, that's just a pebble compared to the foundation upon which we rest our lives. And people can take away almost anything, but they cannot take away the house of God. Because of Christ, we know what we have to do. We know who we are. We have that kind of assurance in the future because it rests on this firm foundation. No matter how weak or how bleak or how hopeful or how hopeless, if Christ is the cornerstone, we can realize we don't have to be moved. We're not going anywhere. But the second idea is that with God's, but God's house is held together by the interlocking brick of each member. Each one of us matters to God and should matter to each other because we are vital to the stability of the Lord's church and to each other. If we hold together in tough times, the storm gets weathered. Love binds us together. And then the building stands firm. Then the church stands firm. Then our hope and our faith stand firm because we stand together, interlocked with each other. And we need each other. And God gave us each other because He knew that separately we wouldn't stand a chance. But together, we are stronger. So in the face of pressure, it's not up to you to stay the course. It's up to us to stay the course together. On September the 8th, 1900, a hurricane of immense ferocity slammed in the city of Galveston, Texas. At the time, Galveston was the largest city in the state of Texas and about to become the biggest in the region. It was headed for greatness. It would rival even New York City, they suspected, as a port city. But that day, storm winds of over 170 miles an hour and seas over 13 feet just devoured the city. It killed the rich and also 93 children who were orphans. In all, in all over 6,000 people lost their lives. And Galveston lost its destiny. It seems that nothing would be left standing, but as the day dawned, there are a few buildings that were still left intact. One of them was a structure now called the Bishop's Palace. With debris bowing before it, it stood erect. Its stones provided the strength to endure the storm and so much more. God built a building that can stand any storm and we are part of that glorious construction. Take heart in God's great blessing. Thank you for being with me today, and I hope you have a good day. I'll see you again next Sunday.